So welcome to today's seminar, uh, where we have Or Mayer speaking about the KRW uh, conjecture. So Or has done a lot of work on different foundational questions in computational complexity theory, and this is certainly one of them. And and uh, Or will uh, explain what the KRW conjecture is all about and and the latest news about it. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Or. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, and Jakub, thanks for inviting me. Uh, okay, so this talk is about uh, the KRW composition theorems via lifting. So I'll explain uh, both parts of the title in a few moments. So, um, but let's start with uh, the basic settings. So uh, this talk and the subject of this talk is circuit complexity. And one of the most important frontiers of uh, circuit complexity is depth complexity. And uh, in this setting, uh, we just ask, uh, what's the minimal depth we need to compute functions? Uh, so the depth of a circuit is just uh, the length of the shortest path from an input to the output, to an, from an input gate to the output gate. The depth complexity of a function is the depth of the shallowest circuit that computes F. And we are trying to prove lower bounds on it. So we are trying to find explicit functions that uh, uh, cannot be computed by circuits of small depth. And for the purpose of this talk, we only consider uh, circuits of uh, fan in two. Um, so the base, so the minimal, uh, so this means that uh, the minimal depth for computing any function that depends on n variables is log n, because otherwise you just can't read all the possible input variables. Um, but, and the major frontier in this uh, question is to come up with a function uh, that uh, requires much more uh, than uh, log n, than depth of of log n, that is a function whose depth complexity is small omega of log n, which is also known as the uh, p versus nc1 question. And this is maybe one of the most important questions of circuit complexity. It's one of the main places we are stuck in proving meaningful lower bounds for uh, functions in p and np. Um, and it's also a very interesting question in its own right. I mean, uh, is other functions that have uh, that can be computed efficiently by a sequential program, but uh, can uh, but cannot be uh, computed efficiently by a circuit of small depth, which is, uh, uh, in other words, a model for a, a, a a parallel for parallel computing. That is the depth complexity of a function. It also measures how hard is it to compute the function in on a parallel computer. So what we are really asking is, are there functions that can be computed efficiently on a sequential computer, but cannot be computed much faster on a, on a parallel computer, which is a very interesting question in its own right. So, or just to understand the, the full depressing picture here. So what we're saying, like if you have an n-bit function, you're limiting the fan in, then logarithmic depth is kind of clear if you need to read the input, right? Exactly. And Log as, as linear size, size as well, but we cannot go beyond linear size and logarithmic depth. Is that like... Uh, yeah, so we can do something that's little better than trivial. So the state of the art says that we can find a function whose uh, depth complexity is at least about three times log n. But uh, so three is already is non-trivial. But uh, you know we would have liked to have here something that is bigger than a constant. And but uh, as you can see, for more or less uh, twenty-four years, no, sorry, thirty-four years. No, sorry, I'm the, sorry, 28 years, we are uh, being uh, stuck at three. Uh, the, I mean, ever since the world of uh, your, the work of Johan, uh, even though uh, Avishai Tal at 2014 managed to improve this uh, small O of one here, we are basically stuck at three for a very long time. So, in the previous works that got it to this constant of three, three is based on the shrinkage technique, but unfortunately it seems that this technique cannot go beyond three. It seems that uh, we have squeezed uh, all the juice we could from this lemon. So um, 
so now the question is, how else can we attack this question? And one approach that was uh, proposed by, by Kachmer, Raz, and Wilson in 91 is to try to understand the composition of functions, or, or actually what's called the block composition of functions. So what is the block composition of functions? So let's say we have two functions, f and g, that take m and n bits respectively, and both are Boolean, that is the output one bit, and we want to compose them. Now, obviously we can compose them in the standard way we compose functions because the output of uh, G is smaller than the input is larger, so uh, is smaller than the input of F. But uh, we can compose them in the following natural way: the composition takes an m by n matrix as an input, and then it uh, and note that the rows of that matrix are valid inputs for G. So uh, we can uh, compute G on each of those rows. And then we get a string A, uh, which is a string of length M. So um, it is a valid input for F. So we can uh, uh, compute F on this string. And we get, um, and then uh, we define uh, the resulting bit as the output of the composed function. So this is a very natural way to compose uh, Boolean functions. And the co next question is, what is the depth complexity of this composition or how this operation behaves with, uh, with respect to depth complexity? So let's start by observing that uh, the ov there is an obvious upper bound. The depth complexity of the composed function is at most the sum of the depth complexities, because if we compute the composition just according to the formula I described, we get a circuit of this depth. And the question is, can we do better? And what uh, Karchmer, Razen, Wigdorson uh, conjectured is that essentially, uh, no, this is the best thing you can do. So there are a few like uh, small letters here. Uh, it, first of all, when I say for every f and g, uh, as in the functions f and g have to be non-constant. And, uh, but otherwise, uh, this is the strongest form of the conjecture that we cannot ref that we do not know how to refute. But uh, even uh, weaker versions of this conjecture uh, would be interesting. In particular, this conjecture is not only interesting in its own right, but uh, Kouchmer, Razen, Wigdorson in 91 uh, showed that if this conjecture is true, then that would imply uh, that P is different than NC1. That is, it would solve this holy grail question that uh, I said that, uh, a few slides ago. And um, uh, again, I stated the, the conjecture in the strongest form, we do not know how to refute, but even much weaker versions of this conjecture would imply, would actually imply that P is different than NC1. Okay, uh, anyone has questions so far? I think it's all clear. Okay, uh, great. So um, let's see how the rest of this talk will go. So uh, the talk will have four parts. I'll uh, describe the background uh, about this conjecture and what's the status of the research now. Then I'll describe our results in the result, our new results in this paper. And our results have uh, two main, I mean, we have two main results, one about monotone composition and the other about semi-monotone composition. So I'll discuss each in a separate section. And let's start by describing the background. So the most common approach in starting in studying the uh, KRW conjecture is using the framework of Kutchmer videos on relations, which means that we relate uh, the depth complexity of a function to the communication complexity of a related communication problem, which is called the Kutchmer videos on relation of F, or the KW relation in short. And this communication problem is defined as follows. Uh, Alice gets a, a string X on which F outputs one. Bob gets a string Y on which F outputs zero. And uh, obviously X and Y must be different strings. So the, in particular, they must disagree on at least one coordinate. And the goal of Alice and Bob is to find such a coordinate. And as usual in communication complexity, they want to do so by communicating as little bits as possible. 
And what uh, Kutchman and Wigdorson observed in 88 is that the debt complexity of F equals exactly to the communication complexity of the kutchman wigdorson relation of F. And this is a very interesting uh, observation and gives us a very useful tool for studying debt complexity because it gives us a, a way to study debt complexity using the, de the lens of communication complexity. One important note that I should make is that here when we talk about communication complexity, we refer to deterministic communication complexity. Actually, it is completely non-interesting to study the randomized communication complexity of KW relations, and we only study the deterministic communication complexity. So in these terms, uh, the, uh, the KW conjecture says that the communication complexity of the KW relation of the composite function is the sum of the communication complexity of the individual uh, KW relations. And we can try to study the conjecture through those lens. So let's see how the KW relation of the composite function looks like. So just and a question me... or regarding this mm -hmm. deterministic model. So it wouldn't make sense to somehow study other communication models and, and hope that you would get results for other circuits? circuit class or, or, or this is like hard enough already or uh, so the thing is that uh, in most other models of communication uh, K, uh, kw relations simply have a very low complexity ah. i mean uh, in, if you consider say non-deterministic um, uh, communication complexity then the, com then the communication complexity is always at most log n if it is, if you consider uh, randomized, and it's always at most two log n. Uh, so uh, you never, you never get me very strong bounds using those models. Ah, yeah, yeah okay, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, only for deterministic communication complexity, you have, we have any hope of getting interesting lower bounds. I mean, that, that's the only case where you can sort of, I mean, I guess the problem in the other settings is that the, the protocols don't use the circuit that we want them to use, right? I mean, if you have randomized communications, you just do hashes of the inputs or something like that, exactly. which is like completely cheating. Exactly. That's exactly what you do. And, in, and of course, in a non-deterministic setting, uh, Merlin can simply give Alice and Bob the index on which they differ and they can verify it using two bits and that's all. Okay, so let's look at the uh, KW relation of the composed function. And uh, for the purpose of stating the results in this area, it is uh, useful to actually denote it like this, KW relation of F composed with the KW relation of G. That is, we pretend that instead of uh, composing the functions and then taking the KW relation, we actually compose the individual KW relations. This is just a useful notation and it will be useful, even more useful later when we will want to compose other things that look like KW relations. So let's look at how this uh, composed uh, KW relation looks like. Uh, so recall that the composition, uh, the composed function takes as inputs uh, m by n matrices. So in the uh, KW relation, the inputs of Alice and Bob are m by n matrices x and y, on which the composer, uh, and they are promised that uh, uh, if Alice runs, uh, invokes the function g on the rows of x, she, get, she gets a string a on which f outputs one. And if Bob uh, computes g on the rows of y, uh, he gets uh, a string B on which F outputs zero. And the goal is to find some entry of the those matrices on which they disagree. And uh, there is a very natural uh, protocol for this com communication problem, which goes as follows. First, let's note that uh, the strings A and B are actually a valid input uh, of the KW relation of F. So uh, we can invoke uh, the best protocol for the KW relation of F to find the coordinate on which A and B differ. And once we have such a coordinate, we know that uh, the corresponding rows of X and Y must differ. And moreover, one of those rows must be a row on which G outputs one, and the other row must be a row on which G outputs zero. So in other words, uh, those rows are also um, 
a, a valid uh, instance of the KW relation of G. So this means that we can now uh, invoke the best protocol for the KW relation of G for, this, uh, for these roles. And what now we get um, a, a, a coordinate on which those roles differ, which is in other words, just an entry on which those matrices differ. So uh, this uh, obvious protocol shows the fact that we observed earlier, which is that the communication complexity of the composed relation is the sum of the is at most the sum of the communication complexities, and this is not surprising because this obvious protocol is just the analog of the obvious circuit for computing the composition that we seen that we have seen earlier. And the KW conjecture essentially states that uh, the obvious protocol is more or less optimal. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, um, yeah. What's the best saving you're aware of, like compared to the actual sum? Sorry, come again. So, so there is some loss, right? So, you, um, the I think the I think the in the best counter example we have, uh, the loss is something like uh, minus O of log log n or something like that. Okay. Or I'm not sure if it's log log n or log log m, but it's something like that. So you're saying that more exactly as stated on this second to last line, it's not true, but sort of except for lower order terms, it might well be true. Exactly. Got I it. mean, so if I, if I go back to the conjecture for a moment, so if I have, if I write at the KW conjecture instead of this approximate inequality greater or equal this sum minus O of log log uh, M log plus or minus O of log log N, then this is probably the strongest conjecture that we do not know how to refute. Uh, but, uh, but the thing is that even if we wrote here like small O of uh, log N or maybe, yeah, but even if we wrote something like small o of log n, it would still imply that uh, p is different than nc1. So uh, this is why I didn't want to state exactly what I mean by this approximate inequality, because, uh, sorry, approximate equality, because there are many versions that would be useful. I see, thanks. Uh, sure. Okay, so now we have this conjecture, and obviously it's very hard because it implies a solution to these holy grail questions. Uh, so uh, the question is, how do we start attacking it? And the start, and already in the original paper, they suggested a nice starting point for attacking this conjecture. Namely, they uh, defined another communication problem called the universal relation, which is kind of a simplification of KW relations. And in the KW and in the universal relation, Alice gets a string X as an input, Bob gets a string Y as an input, and now we don't have any promise about X and Y, except that they are different. But now, uh, since they are different, they again have to disagree on at least one coordinate, and the goal of Alice and Bob is uh, to find such a coordinate. So this is basically a KW relation in which we removed this uh, extra complicated promise that uh, X and Y uh, differ on the out, have different uh, values of F or that F outputs different values of X and, on X and Y. And we just left the, the immediate conclusion that uh, X and Y are different strings. And that uh, simplifies this communication problem uh, considerably. First means that every KW relation uh, reduces to the universal relation. This is why this relation is kind of universal or complete. And also it is very easy to prove that the communication complexity of this uh, relation is at least N, which is actually much, which is actually larger than what we could hope for any function. So this is a relation that's much easier to analyze. And uh, 
Uh, KRW suggested that we can start uh, by analyzing the composition of such relations. Now, so actually, so it is possible to define the composition of such uh, two universal relations in a natural way. It, it, the definition doesn't follow from the definition I gave you, but it, there is a very natural way to define such a composition. And, uh, and uh, Kachmer, Azen, Vigdorson suggested as an open problem to prove the natural analog of the conjecture for such a composition. And this challenge was met first by Edmonds in Pagliazzo, Rudich and Sugal in 91, and then by uh, Hastad and Vigdorson in 93. Uh, and uh, somewhat later, uh, in a joint work with Gavinsky, uh, Dima Gavinsky, Omri Weinstein, and I Vigdorson, and then with Sajin Koros. Uh, we managed to prove such a, a natural analog of the conjecture for the composition of a KW relation of a function with the universal conjecture. So uh, this is like, I would like to think about it as going half of the way. We want to prove the conjecture for the composition of two, com of two re KW relations. We know how to prove it for two re universal relations. So uh, now we could prove it for one, KW relation and one universal relation, but uh, unfortunately, it's it seems like we went the easy half of the way, and the other half of the way is much harder. Uh, now, already in '93, uh, in the celebrated work of Hastad on the shrinkage exponent, uh, he actually showed that uh, uh, the 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 KW conjecture holds. Uh, in the special case where an f can be any function and g is the parity function, um, and in and in a work with Sirit in 2016, uh, we proved it in a different way using KW relations. And in a very recent work, together with Yuval uh, Filmus and Avishai Tal. Uh, we generalize this result for every function G that has tight uh, adversary bound. So, uh, this, uh, so this allows us to prove the conjecture not just for the case of G equals parity, but also for a few more functions such as subjectivity. But uh, still this, this is not many functions. It gives us a few more interesting functions, but not many more. And uh, finally, in, in a very interesting work uh, from last year, Ivan uh, uh, Mihajlin and Alexander Small considered the other uh, way to compose, to compose the universal relation with a function, that is universal relation composed with a function G. They could not prove it for every function G, but they proved that there exists some, there exists at least one a maximally hard function G for this, for which this uh, composition satisfies the KRW conjecture. And just to explain how impressive this result was, is if uh, even though the result is only existential for G, if we could replace the universal relation here with a result that holds for every function F, that would be enough to imply uh, that P is different than NC1 that would be enough to prove uh, those uh, super logarithmic depth lower bounds that we want to prove. And so this is, is a question that I've been thinking about for a very long time and I'm really fascinated by uh, their solution. So can you mm -hmm. remind me what the adversary bound here means? Oh, uh, so, uh, okay, it's actually something from quantum query complexity. Uh, going into the definition takes about, uh, uh, will take some time, but uh, okay, one way to think about it is it's kind of gen a generalization of the Kapchenko bound. Oh, oh, actually, maybe the best intuitive way to describe it is to say, okay, let's say that we can find some distribution over an input to uh, the KW relation of G. Uh, so we find some random distribution over inputs to the KW relation of G, such that uh, 
every coordinate has very low probability of being uh, the, the right solution for uh, the KW relation. That is, for every specific i, the probability that x and y differ on this coordinate is rather small. So uh, if we so uh, if we can come up with these distributions, and this actually gives us naturally a lower bound on the communication complexity of on the KW on the communication complexity of the KW relation of G, because if uh, because this gives us some kind of a hard distribution for the KW relation, if uh, if every particular coordinate has a small probability of being the solution, it means that Alice and Bob can just guess the solution. They have to communicate a lot to find it. Um, and uh, if, uh, and so what we showed that whenever such a hard distribution gives you a tight bound on the communication complexity of G, uh, then this, uh, then the KRW conjecture holds for this G. Um, so maybe, so a simple example would be parity. If you take like uh, for uh, the hard distribution, a random edge on the hypercube, that is two uh, random uh, strings that differ on exactly one coordinate, then every coordinate has a probability of only one over N of being the right solution to the KW relation, because the, the two strings differ only on one coordinate and this coordinate is uniformly distributed. So, uh, and in the case of parity, this actually gives a tight lower bound on the, uh, on the communication complexity of the KW relation of parity. And this is kind of a generalization of this lower bound method. Okay. And great, uh, other questions? So is it obvious that the Mikhailin small result would like give you P not equal to NC1 or is it depend on what you mean by maximally hard? Is the point is that, that if the composition is maximally hard then you can plug it in as your new G or, or what does uh, what happen? Okay. So, the, so the idea, so, okay. So formally, if it is true that for every F there exists a maximally hard G, uh, for which the conjecture holds, uh, then we can separate P and then C1. And actually we don't even really need the uh, maximally hard G, just enough that G is non-trivially hard, is non-trivially hard. Uh, I think that it's even enough that G would be like, would have depth complexity, depth complexity of some of like omega of log N or maybe even omega of log log N, I'm not sure. Um, you you no, get no, I some think you need the omega of log n. Okay, you'd get some worst case function then by just somehow existentially taking all of these and composing them and exactly. So you are doing some kind of an iterative process for for constructing the hard function. You start by with with any g and then you say okay, I can now by the result there exists another g that I can compose it with, and then there is a third g that I can compose it with and. Uh, by doing it like log n over log log n times, you get a hard function. Uh, okay, so those are the known results. And what's common for uh, all those, so now let's discuss our new results. So what's common for all those results is that they, most of them hold for every f, but uh, they hold only for very few choices of g. So uh, now uh, the uh, so if we want to go to the full KRW conjecture, we somehow need to go for from every f and few g's to every f and every g. And uh, uh, so, in the, as an intermediate goal, we could uh, start by uh, trying to extend the range of functions g that we could handle. Um, May, maybe if we could uh, prove the KRW conjecture for many more Gs, even not even if not for every G, then uh, it then it would help us develop our techniques such that uh, eventually we will have sufficiently strong techniques uh, to prove the full scale conjecture. 
So this is a nice intermediate goal, but the problem with this intermediate goal that we don't have many candidates for more functions G that uh, we could handle. Uh, and this, and essentially the issue is that we don't have uh, too many KW relations that are well understood. Like parity and more generally functions with a tight adversary bound is more or less the limit of what we understand about KW relations. We don't have too many other functions for which we understand uh, the KW relation. So the question is, okay, are there, can we still find candidate Gs for which we could, that we could study as an intermediate goal or the only way to go is try to attack the KW conjecture head on, which I would preferably not do. I mean, I prefer to start uh, small and uh, try to go in small steps uh, if possible. And uh, the idea behind this war is that actually, if we look at a different setting, that is the monotone setting, then in the monotone setting, there are many KW relations that we understand very well. So maybe if we want to develop our techniques further and uh, improve our understanding of the KW conjecture, we should first look at the monotone setting where we understand KW relations much better. So let me, so what we do in this work is first, we consider the monotone KRW conjecture. And we also, and not just the, we don't consider just the monotone conject, KRW conjecture, we also consider a new conjecture that in a new setting that we define and call the semi-monotone uh, setting. And we prove both conjectures for many inner functions. Uh, Formally, we prove them for uh, all inner functions whose lower bounds are proved by lifting theorems. And this is a very, very large uh, family of functions, as I'll discuss uh, shortly. So these are our two main results. Uh, a KRW conjecture for many functions G in the monotone setting and such a KRW conjecture for the, a new semi-monotone setting. So let me first briefly review what the monotone setting is and what lifting is. So uh, the monotone setting uh, consists of uh, circuits without, so monotone circuits are circuits without not gates, uh, which are circuits, that, and such circuits only compute monotone functions, that is functions in which if you increase some coordinate, it can only, some input coordinate, it can only increase the output. And we denote the depth complexity of a function by, uh, of, by, we denote the monotone depth complexity by M D of F, which is just the depth complexity of computing F by monotone circuits. And monotone depth complexity also has an analog in monotone KW relations. So the monotone KW relation of F, which we denote by M K W F, is again the game in which Alice gets a string X on which F outputs one and Bob gets a string Y on which F outputs zero. But now uh, they have a coordinate uh, I in which, but now they want to find the coordinate I in which not only X is different than Y, but actually X is actually larger than Y. And such a coordinate uh, must exist since we must choose a monotone function F. Since, and therefore F uh, must be monotone. And Karchamer and Wigderson observed in 88 that, again, uh, the monotone depth complexity of F equals exactly to the monotone KW relation, to the communication complexity of the monotone KW relation. And in this setting, actually, KW relations have been very, very successful. I mean, the, I think the vast majority of the lower bounds we have uh, for uh, monotone depth complexity goes via monotone KW relations, uh, including uh, functions as, such as ST connectivity, uh, click, matching, which are like the classical functions. But there are many, many more functions for which we have lower bounds using KW relations. I won't have time uh, for going through all of them. 
But one more notable function that I want to mention is the generation function, which uh, was used in 97 to separate the enzyme hierarchy and was also used in many works following that work. Now going uh, to lifting, which is another important notion in this talk. Um, so uh, lifting is a technique uh, for proving lower bounds in communication complexity. I think more of the audience, most of the audience probably knows about lifting uh, more than I do, but uh, I'll describe it in detail uh, for the benefit of uh, people watching the recording. So, uh, uh, so the way lifting works is okay so first of all lifting is a technique for proving lower bounds and it has an immense amount of applications especially it found ma many many applications in the recent years this long list is a very very partial list actually and uh, this uh, and all i'm going to say about th this technique right now is that it proves lower bounds on special on a special kinds of problems called lifted problems and the lifted problem is actually a problem that is obtained by lifting, uh, uh, by composing uh, two, pro two problems using the notion of block composition that we saw before. But here, uh, the, the outer problem S is not, a fun is not a Boolean function, but any search problem that can take any K bits and output out, uh, solutions in any range O and it can all, and, a single input can have multiple uh, uh, valid solutions. And know that S is actually not a communication problem. Uh, it takes a single string as its input. Now the inner function on the other hand, which is sometimes called the gadget function, is a communication problem. It takes two strings as an input and we expect to give those two strings to Alice and Bob respectively. So the composed uh, prob problem, the lifted problem, uh, is actually a communication complexity problem in which uh, Alice gets uh, k uh, strings of length b, Bob gets uh, k strings of length b, and they are supposed to uh, compute the gadget function on each pair of strings of length b, and then uh, solve S on the resulting strings of string of length K. Again, this is the same definition of block compositions that we have seen before. Uh, so, and, lift, and in general, lifting theorems uh, prove lower bounds on uh, problems of this form. Usually there are some limitations on the kind of gadget uh, that one can choose. And sometimes there are also limitations on the kind of search problems S that one could choose. Now, many lower bounds on monotone KW relations were shown using lifting theorems by taking the following two steps. First, we choose some lifted problems, leave some lifted problem and reduce it to the KW relation. And then we use the lifting theorem to prove a, a lower bound on uh, the lifted problem. And then the reduction means that the same lower bound holds for the KW relation as well. Uh, and in this work, we use two such lifting theorems. One is a lifting theorem uh, from a joint work of myself with Arkadev Chattopadhyay, Yuval Filmus, Jim Corus, and Tony Intitasi. Uh, but uh, we could. Now we only use uh, this particular lifting theorem because it was the most convenient one to use, but we could also use uh, many other lifting theorems for, uh, for lifting uh, query complexity from the past, such as the one of Raz McKenzie from 97 or the follow-ups uh, from uh, 2017. And the other uh, lifting theorem that we use is a very recent lifting, lifting theorem from Nelson's degree uh, due to, uh, which is a joint work with Susanna Derezende uh, in the audience, uh, uh, Jacob, Jacob Nordstrom, uh, Tony Pitassi, Robert Robert, and Mark Vignals, basically the authors of this work uh, plus uh, Mark Vignals. Um, 
Okay, uh, any questions so far? So uh, now uh, I can finally state our results. Um, uh, so uh, our uh, uh, so the first result concerns the monotone KRW conjecture, which would say that basically for every monotone, two monotone functions, you would expect the monotone depth complexity to be the sum of the composition to be the sum of the individual depth complexities. Or alternatively, that the communication complexity of the composed monotone KW relations would be the sum of the individual communication complexities. And uh, we prove uh, this conjecture for every monotone function f, and for every fun monotone function g whose lower bound can be proved by the lifting theorem I, mean, I mentioned before, or by any other. Uh, and we again we could also prove it for functions g for which the lower bound could be proved by the previous lifting theorem for query complexities. But I don't think there is any function g that distinguishes those lifting theorems. Um, was well, that you could prove the amount of KRW conjecture? Would that have any consequences that we don't already know how to prove? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, actually, yes. Yeah. So, uh, in general, the monotone KRW conjecture might be more tractable than the KRW conjecture because it does not imply any lower any circuit lower bounds that we do not already know how to prove. I mean, the monotone KRW conjecture is very interesting on its own right as a question about. Uh, monotone depth complexity, but uh, it does. But uh, as an approach to proving new circuit lower bounds, it doesn't prove anything we don't already know, which is in a sense good news because it means that uh, it might be much more tractable, which makes it a nice um, stepping stone toward the full uh, KRW conjecture. So I mean, toward the non-monotone KRW conjecture. But yes, it doesn't apply any. Uh, low circuit low ones that we do not already know how to prove. Going back to uh, the statement of our result, we put them. So when I say that the lower band for G can be proved by the lifting theorem, I mean there is a, a reduction from a lifting problem for which the lifting theorem holds to the monotone KW relation of G. And this includes classical functions such as ST connectivity, click, or generation. And uh, I think that it basically includes every monotone G for which we have a lower bound except matching. I mean, at least I am not aware of any G except matching for which our result does not hold and for which we have a lower bound. Um, Okay, uh, questions so far? Okay, so I think the monotone KRW conjecture is a very interesting conjecture in its own right. And uh, it's also a good stepping stone toward the non-monotone KRW conjecture. And overall, I really like this result, but what we really aim to do is uh, what we really want to do eventually is to really go to the non-monotone non setting. So it would be more interesting if we could prove something about non-monotone functions. And in order to do to say some to make some step toward the non-monotone setting, we introduce a new setting called the semi-monotone setting or semi-monotone composition. And in our notion of the semi-monotone composition, the function, the outer function f is non-monotone, and the function g is monotone. Or it would be more accurate to say that the kW relation of f is non-monotone and the kW relation of g is monotone. So let me define uh, this composition and first let me motivate it for a, a bit. So let's recall that uh, in the standard composition, in the standard, standard non-monotone composition, uh, X and Bob get those matrices X and Y, and they can generate those strings A and B by applying G to the rows of X and Y. They are promised that uh, uh, F outputs one and zero on A and B respectively. 
And this means that A and B are a legal instance of uh, the com uh, of the composed uh, function. Sorry, are a legal instance of the KW relation of F. So they can find the coordinate on which A and B differ by solving the KW relation of F and A and B. And once they find such a coordinate I, they can solve the KW relation of G on these rows, because on this row, they know that one of the rows, uh, on one of these rows, uh, G outputs one, and on the other one, it outputs zero. However, Ellis and Bob can also decide that they ignore uh, completely uh, the solution, uh, the uh, and the roles on which uh, Ellis and Bob uh, disagree and uh, on A and B, and instead try to dis try to solve uh, the KW relation of the composition on some row on which A is actu actually equal to B. But in this case, uh, they might have much harder time. First of all, they have to solve the universal relation because now they are try just trying to solve, uh, to find a different coordinate in just two strings on which they have no promise. And furthermore, if they are trying to solve the KW relation in a row I where, uh, uh, where A and B are equal, they are not even pro promised that those rows are different. Those rows could be equal. So uh, they might uh, not even uh, uh, be able to solve on this row at all. They might work very hard trying to find a solution in this row and not find any solution. So overall, it seems like this is a very bad idea for Alice and Bob, but we cannot rule out the possibility that they will try to do so. So in any lower bound that we are trying to prove, we have to account for this possibility. Now, when we, count, when we go to define uh, the semi-monotone composition, we define it in exactly the same way, except that we say that Whenever Alex and Bob found a row on which AI is different than BI, they are allowed to solve the monotone KW relation of G instead of solving uh, the KW, the non-monotone KW relation of G. So again, F is still a non-monotone function and uh, Alex and Bob can try to find a coordinate on which A and B disagree by, by solving the non-monotone KW relation of F. And again, they can try to solve the universal relation on rows on which A and B agree. But in, wherever A and B uh, disagree, we allow them to solve the non-monotone KW relation of G. We, or they should solve the KW relation of G, the, non -mono, the monotone KW relation of G, instead of the non-monotone KW relation of G. Now, the way we define it formally is that uh, we say that Ellis and Bob uh, should output an entry IJ that satisfies one of the following requirements. Either they found a, a row on which AI is greater than BI, and in this case, they have to solve the monotone KW relation of G in this, in this direction. And that is, they have to find a coordinate in which the row of X is greater, is bigger than the row of Y or they find the coordinate uh, a row i where b uh, is greater than a and then they have to find the coordinate in the row in which the matrix y is greater than the matrix x or uh, they, they just look at the row uh, in which a is equal to b and in such rows they are allowed to output any entry in which those matrices differ but again in such rows there is no promise that such a coordinate even exists Uh, so, any question about uh, this definition? So, again, the motivation for this definition is to try to come up with a comp notion of composition that combines the hardness of solving the non-monotone KW relation of F and the monotone KW relation of G. But I should say that uh, this notion of composition does not correspond to any notion or to any notion of depth complexity of circuits that we know of. I mean, not only it doesn't prove any circuit lower bound, we can't even relate the communication complexity of this relation to the depth complexity on any model of circuits. 
but still we think it's an interesting notion that is worth studying, at least as a stepping stone for the KRW conjecture. Now I'll define another notion of this kind of composition because we're going to use it soon. So we also define the composition of the universal relation with a monotone KW relation, uh, which is defined similarly, except that we throw F out of the window and instead and instead of promising that uh, to Alice and Bob that there is some F on we, that outputs one on A and zero on B, they are now only to promise that A and B are two different strings period. They don't have any other promise. So this basically means that A and B are now uh, valid instances of the universal relation. So again, uh, Alice and Bob uh, can try to find the coordinate on which A and B differ by uh, by uh, invoking the best protocol for the universal relation. So now, so now what we would really like to prove is the semi is the KRW conjecture for the semi-monotone composition. And that is to say that for any F and G, the communication complexity of the KW relation of F and the monotone KW relation, G is the sum of the individual communication complexities. Unfortunately, we do not know how to prove it uh, for, fun for functions f. We only know how to prove a simpler uh, conjecture when uh, uh, we replace the, the non-monotone KW relation of f with the universal relation. So we prove this, simple, this simpler conjecture for every monotone function g whose lower bound is proved by the lifting theorem from Nalschel-Zalz degree that I, mon that I mentioned earlier. And this, again, and this is a less general lifting theorem, but it still includes many, many interesting functions, including those classical functions I mentioned before, so ST connectivity, click, and generation, but not the matching function. Uh, questions about this result? Okay, I think this concludes the our results section. Uh, Jakob, how many, how much time do I have before uh, going uh, into the break? Well, we're uh, nearing the hour, but we're very flexible and defer to our speakers. So, you know, it's really up to you. But it's a, it's a few minutes before the hour, but if you need a, a few more minutes, then please go ahead. Okay, so I'll so I, I might, won't I go might have over a uh, all the remaining slides, but I'll but in each part I have a few uh, slides that uh, describe the intuition for the proof. So I'll go over these slides. In uh, so can part. I can I ask a question about the sure. slide? Sure. So I think maybe I asked you this before a long time ago, but there is this connection between monotone and non-monotone circuit complexity uh, through slice, these slice, slice functions. functions. So I wonder what happens if you kind of apply that connection for the semi-monotone conjecture. So I guess we didn't con um, conclude that the monotone KRW and the general are related, even though these slice functions exist. But what about in this semi-monotone case? Oh, uh, I think you asked me about the monotone case, actually. And in the monotone case, uh, all I can say is that uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, uh, the main difficulty is that the composition of slice functions is not a slice function. So, right. uh, um, yeah, so, so the composition I, of a slice I, function is not necessarily a slice function. Yeah, so I, I'm looking at the simpler conjecture now. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if it's different from uh, the, yeah, so the what I would say is that in the monotone case, at least I can say that Ben Rossman uh, put some significant effort in trying to show something like the monotone KRW conjecture implies the, the non-monotone one and, and it didn't work. I, uh, for the semi-monotone conjecture, I, I don't think, I don't know if anyone tried it. I don't know how would one go and try to establish such a connection exactly because this uh, conject this semi-monotone conjecture 
same monoton setting does not correspond to a circuit model. So, and I think the way to show the you know, this connection via slice function goes via the circuit perspective, not through the communication complexity perspective. So I don't know how I would even start considering the connection for slice functions. But uh, yes, I okay. actually haven't considered this direction at all, sorry. Yeah, so I, like you could ask it of this, uh, what you have as a simpler conjecture where there's this universal relation, um, you know, whether the monotone, the M in that expression, whether it makes any difference. But yeah, maybe uh, we have to think about this offline. Any difference, sorry? So yeah, it's oh. like, let's say you prove the simpler conjecture, then do mm -hmm. you prove... Um, yes, we do not know same... how to prove it for, for non-monotone KW relations of G. Uh, sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, say you proved the monotone version, mm -hmm. does the non-monotone one follow? Oh, I see. Uh, oh, now I understand the question. Uh, no, it, what would follow from the monotone conjecture is the same for the, what's called the monotone universal relation. There is also a monotone version of the universal uh -huh. relation, but uh, not, but it wouldn't work for the universe, the non-monotone universal relation. Be basically because uh, non-monotone KW relations also reduce to the universal relation. Okay, thanks. Uh, sure. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so I'll try to uh, give an, okay, let me first state the results a bit more formally and then I'll go to say some, a little about the intuition for those results and then we can take a break. So, Start, let's start with the monotone results. So we, let's say we have some two function, monotone functions, f and g, and the lifted problem that reduces uh, to the monotone KW relation of g, and the lifting theorem uh, says that gives a lower bond of t on the, this communication complexity of the lifted problem. Then we get a low, oh, actually, oh, sorry. Yeah, so the result says that the lift, that the communication complexity of the composed uh, relation and is uh, at least the communication complexity of the monotone KW relation of F plus omega of T. So we have here the lower bound you get from the lifted, uh, from the lifting theorem. In particular, if the lower bound we get from the lifting theorem is tight, which is often the case, then uh, we get the KRW conjecture. Um, okay, so uh, let's recall for a moment how uh, that in the com in the monotone case, the Ellis and Bob should find an entry on which X is strictly greater than Y. Now, the crucial observation here that uh, makes the monotone conjecture much easier than uh, the non-monotone one is uh, that an observation already due to Kachmer and Wilderson that says that in the non-monotone in the monotone case we can actually force the protocol to find to solve the problem on a row where AI is greater than BI. That is, uh, we can change we can effectively change the definition of the composition such that instead of saying find an entry such that xij is greater than yij, we can change it to saying find the ij such that both xij is greater than yj and a is greater than bi. This means if we, uh, if you remind, if you recall uh, when I talked about the semi-monotone composition, I said, well, we can't rule out that a and Bob are trying to solve the problem on a row where a and b differ. Uh, sorry, where a and b agree and then they're trying to solve the universal relation and we have to take it into account when proving uh, lower bounds. 
Uh, well, in the monotone case, we can actually forget about this possibility. The, we can rule out this possibility, which makes everything much nicer. And the KRW conjecture that it says again that this obvious that the obvious protocol is optimal. And it's much easier to understand one why this should why this obvious protocol should be optimal once we define the goal in, uh, in this way. I mean, why would the obvious protocol would be optimal? Well, we know that the Ellis and Bob have to solve the monotone KW relation of F in order to find an I such that AI is greater than BI. We know that they have to solve the uh, to find the mono to solve the monotone KW relation of G to find a coordinate inside the row on which X is greater than Y. So we know they have to solve both each of them. So the communication complexity should be the sum of the communication complexities, except of course, this is kind of a direct sum question. I mean, it, we know the Ellis and Bob have to solve both of them, but how do we know that? But since they are allowed to solve them simultaneously, how do we know that they cannot obtain some saving when they are solving both of them simultaneously? I mean, we have to somehow show that they have to solve each of them separately. And uh, the intuition is that uh, Ellis and Bob, that we should show that Ellis and Bob uh, uh, must solve uh, uh, cannot solve the monotone KW relation of G before they solve the monotone KW, the monotone KW relation of F. Because if they have not solved the monotone KW relation of F, they won't know on which row they should solve uh, the monotone KW relation of G. So this is the basic intuition behind the uh, uh, the uh, this result, but there is one. Okay, let me skip some slides that go into more details. And instead, okay, I suggest that you look only on the second part of this slide. And um, uh, let me and uh, let me say that even if we can say that uh, Ellis and Bob uh, have to first solve F and only then solve G we still have run into some problem because once they solve, uh, uh, because suppose they solved F and then they go on to time to solve G. Uh, they still have some advantage over just solving uh, the monotone KW relation of G on its own because first they are getting multiple instances of G and they can solve which of them they want to solve. So, the actual problem they are solving is given multiple instances of MK of the monotone KW relation of G, choose one of them and solve it. And second, while they were solving the monotone KW relation of F, they might have transmitted uh, some uh, use, use some information on those rows that might make it uh, use that might be useful in solving one of the instances of uh, G. So we have to somehow show that they cannot do it. And this is where the lifting comes into play. I mean, the thing, the thing is that if that actually, once you have a lifted uh, search problem uh, that uh, you can lower bound using a lifting theorem, it's pretty easy to show that even uh, if, um, uh, that even if you are given multiple instances of the of the lifted search problem and you can choose one of them and solve it, then it's still as hard as solving a single instance. Um, more essentially because choosing one of the instances and solving it is still a lifting is still a lifted problem. Um, and if you go into the details of the listing theorem, you can also see that uh, even if the Alice and Bob are given some information on each instance, it doesn't matter uh, too much for the listing theorem. But I can go into more details about this point later. Let me just say that uh, as part of dealing with this uh, problem, we prove a generalization of the lifting of the non lifting theorem that says that. Uh, we can prove a law that says that we get a lower bound 
on, uh, lift, on uh, a lifted problem, of, even if uh, some bits of information on each row are given in advance. This does not follow from the original lifting theorems and it requires a bit of work to generalize them to imply it, but I mean, it's not very hard, but one new idea is actually required to prove it. Uh, that if you have that in the original lifting theorem, if you have a bit of information about each row, then you can, uh, 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 then the lifting theorem uh, still holds. Okay, let me go back. Now let's go into the semi monotone composition. Again, I only go into a few slides to discuss intuition. So again, uh, in the semi-monotone composition, uh, we have on, on rows on which A is different than BI, they can solve the monotone KW relation and in other rows, they can solve the universal relation. Um, and the thing is that uh, if you, so in the monotone result, I said that uh, Okay, I can see uh, it's true that in principle, the players can solve, uh, okay, in the monoton setting, I can force the, the players to solve the problem on rows in which AI is greater than BI, which means essentially that the result, that solving the KRW problem essentially reduces to solve one instance of, of um, the monoton KW relation of G out of many, and the latter problem can be analyzed using the lifting theorem. In the semi-monotone case, this is no longer true. Alice and Bob can, the trick of KRW that says that we can force them to solve on a row in which A is greater than BI no longer holds. So they can find a solution either in a row where A is different than BI or in a row in which A equals BI, which means that the players can solve either an instance of the monotone KW relation of G or an instance of the universal relation. And therefore, if I want now uh, to use the leasing theorem to analyze the second step, it's not enough that, I, that the lower bound on the monotone KW relation of G can be proved using, using a lifting theorem. I also need the same property to hold for the universal relation. And I can actually do it in the semi-monotone case because in the, partic in the very particular lifting theorem that we use, we can choose the gadget to be the equality function. And using this particular gadget, we can, uh, uh, we can show that the lifted problem also reduces to the universal relation and not just to the monotone. We can also have a, li a lifted problem that is that reduces to the universal relation and not just a lifted problem that reduces to the monotone KW relation. And once we have that, we can again use the lifting theorem to deal with the second part in which Alice and Bob solve the, uh, solve the problem on one of the rows. This is the intuition of what's going on. Uh, I can go into more details in the second part of the talk. Okay, I'm sorry for going uh, late. Uh, this is a good time to take the break. Absolutely, no worries, or thank you so much for the presentation so far. Before we have a short break for, for coffee and bio break and what have you, are there any questions? I mean, obviously there are uh, quite a few questions about what's going on under the hood but there's a hope that we will learn more about this um after the break so if there are no questions then i suggest we take like a, a 10 minute break um and uh, and then we'll be back after that so we're back after the break uh, for the second uh, more technical part of ors uh, seminar so uh, the floor is yours, or please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, let, so now I'll go into more detail about what I started saying uh, in before the break. Uh, 
So let's me go briefly over what I mentioned about the monotone conjecture. So uh, the, our result about the monotone conjecture mean, says that uh, the communication complexity of the composition is at least the communication complexity of F plus what you would, plus omega of the lower one you would get from the lifting theorem. And a crucial uh, point in this proof is that uh, is an observation of uh, Kachmer, Raz, and Wigderson that uh, you can actually force the problem uh, uh, force the protocol to, sol to find a solution in a row uh, where, uh, I, uh, where a i is greater than b i. That is, instead of uh, de uh, declaring that the goal of the protocol is to find an entry on which the matrix x is greater than y, we can also ask that this entry would be in a row where a is greater than b. And we want to prove that uh, the obvious protocol that we mentioned before for this problem is optimal. Is this easy to see or you're going to tell us or uh, where we accept it? Uh, it's relatively easy. I just want to save time, uh -huh. but the okay, I'll say it in two sentences. Basically the idea is that uh, Alice in all her rows uh, where A is equal zero, in all the i's where a i is zero, she just replaces the row in x with an all zero string. And uh, Bob uh, goes over his matrix and whenever b i equals one, he replaces the row with the all one string. And uh, then obviously they cannot find uh, the solution in rows uh, uh, in which uh, x i is not so greater than yij. Uh, uh, xij, in, sorry, they cannot find a solution where in rows where ai is not strictly greater than bi. And that's the reduction, more or less. Um, okay, thanks. Um, okay. So, uh, so intuitively, why should the protocol, obvious protocol be optimal? Well, uh, again, as I said, uh, Edison Bob must solve at least the monotone KW relation of F at least to find this I where A is greater than BI, and they have to solve the monotone KW relation of G in some row in order to find an entry in which X is greater than Y. So the question is, can we show that they cannot somehow save communication? Okay. Obviously, they, when we say that they have to solve both, then they have to solve, they have to spend at least the communication complexity of F to do the first thing, and at least the communication complexity of G to do the second thing. But the question is, can they recycle bits? Can they somehow solve them simultaneously and um, re, uh, somehow gain saving by the fact that they do it simultaneously? Um, and the and this is actually a direct sum question and in the original KRW paper, they even phrased it like that. They showed that if we had a direct sum theorem for monotone uh, KW relations, then it would imply the monotone KRW conjecture. But, uh, and we do not solve the general direct sum question, but we do show, use the following intuition to prove it in this case. And in, the intuition is that Alice and Bob must solve the monotone KW relation of F before they even start solving the monotone KW relation of G. Uh, because before they solve the monotone KW relation of F, they don't even know on which row they should be solving the monotone KW relation of G. So, um, uh, so uh, obviously there is no... Uh, point on uh, starting working on some row before they, uh, so on some row i before they found out that a i is greater than b i on this row. And if they, uh, and if they only start solving the monotone KW relation of G af after they solve the monotone KW relation of F, then obviously they cannot save communication because they are not really solving them simultaneously. So now, the, so it remains to actually show that uh, they have to solve. Okay, so the first thing that we want to show is that really they have to solve G only after they solve F. 
and to see it, let's look at what happens in the protocol just, be, just immediately before they send uh, enough bits to, set, to solve F. So let's, let's imagine that we run the protocol and, ju and just before they send enough bits to solve F, we'll pause the protocol and look at uh, the situation. Well, we know that at this point, uh, the protocol has not solved the monotone KW relation of F yet. And also we know that it, just because of an averaging argument, just because the communication complexity of uh, F is uh, smaller than the length of, than the number of rows, uh, on average, they sent less than one bit per row. Per row. So this means that they didn't send much information about uh, the average row or the typical row. So in, intuitively, if they proceed to solve the, uh, so if they uh, try to solve the uh, KW relation of G, uh, if they go on and find a solution in a row, in a typical row, they, the haven't so they haven't made any substantial progress on G, and this means they still have to send at least the communication complexity of G bits. And since they on, they send those bits only after they sent those uh, those CC MKWF bits, the total number of bits they send in this protocol is the communication complexity of F plus the communication complexity of G. So that's the basic intuition. If, if we were assured that the players uh, that are solve the problem, find a solution in a typical row, then since they didn't solve, send much bits of much information about the typical rows, they basically have to solve the KW relation of G from scratch on those rows and therefore they have to transmit another amount of bits that is equal to the communication complexity of MKWG. Uh, any questions so far? I mean, when you say information sent per row, we're measuring entropy, I guess, and checking. Uh, not really entropy, but some other measure of information, but uh, we actually use this uh, framework from Raz McKenzie of average degree of average degree. Uh, it's a measure of information from the lifting literature. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, okay. So I, I presume the challenge is somehow to hide the solution to the compost problem in a typical row. Uh, more or less. Uh, actually, we do something else. Uh, the The idea is actually is really to force them to solve on a no, and to solve the problem on a typical row. Usually, in works in the KR, on the KRW conjecture, the hard part is to force them to solve the to work on a typical row. But but actually, in this particular case, this part is easy. But let me mention for a moment that uh, okay. Really, there are, might be atypical roles on which Alice and Bob communicated a lot while they were trying to solve F. And it might be so easy to solve G on these roles. So really we have to ensure that the players do not solve, do not, cannot solve the monotone KW relation of G on atypical roles. And, um, uh, and as I said, usually in works on the KRW conjecture, this is the hard part, but in our case, this is the easy part. And, but before we say, we explain why, let me say, how can we do it? How can we prevent them from solving uh, G on the atypical roles? Well, know that at this point, the players have not solved the KW relation of F yet. So uh, this means that we can uh, make sure that we have some control on which rows can be valid solutions of the monotone KW relation of F. And in particular, we will try to force the solution to the monotone KW relation of F, this coordinate I, where AI is greater than BI, to be in one of the typical rows. So uh, 
let me say a few more words on, about it. So what we actually do is essentially to, this is actually an adversary argument and what the adversary does in this point, at this point is just to choose the inputs such that um, they satisfy that AI is less or equal to BI on each typical row. And if you remember by this KRW trick, uh, the protocol is required to find a solution in a row where AI is greater than BI. So once we do this forcing, once we force AI is smaller or equal, is less or equal than BI on each typical row, this basically forces the players to solve um, uh, to solve uh, the problem on a typical row. Now, why can we do it? So intuitively, because at this point, the protocol has, has not solved uh, the KW relation of F uh, yet, then uh, the players do not know any particular Q coordinate in which uh, uh, this, uh, they do, the players do not know for sure for any I that AI is greater than BI. So for any particular i, we can so force the uh, it, we can force AI to be less or equal to BI. So that's the intuition. Technically, what happens is that well, there is some tra trade-off. Uh, basically, we we don't start just one bit before they communicated enough bits to solve uh, the KW relation of F. We start we we stop say I don't know um m bits or k or say k bits before they solve uh, the kw relation of f and then and there is a theorem that says that if we stopped say about k bits before uh, they solved the kw relation of f then uh, we are free to force ai is less or equal to bi for about k rows and then we have to choose the parameters such that we can ensure that there are at most k atypical rows, and but this can be guaranteed. Uh, this is uh, this is the intuition. Uh, I can go into more details if you like, but uh, okay. Any questions so far? So I, I can, I'm trying to imagine the proof. Is it just that you kind of start tracing the protocol from its root and maybe mm -hmm. following the, um, you're borrowing the strategy, the adversary strategy for this F, which mm -hmm. you assume exists. And you just, uh, you've given the protocol these like matrix-like inputs, uh, but you kind of somehow project it to an input to F like the, the matrices mm -hmm. become these rows. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you have to have something like, what is this projection operation? So that's maybe one creative. Oh, uh, this projection uh, operation is simply applying uh, the function G to the rows of the matrix. Okay. I mean, give, well, once you have X and Y, you automatically know A and B. So, so what really going, what's really going on is that, okay, I am again hiding some details under the rug, but basically you look at the rectangle you have, uh, that where the rectangle is like X's and, has X, X's and Y's, and you can turn it, and just by applying G to the rows of the matrices, you can get like a corresponding rectangles for F, that has A's and B's. Yeah. Now you ask what's the what's the formula complexity or what's the communication complexity of that rectangle, and you do this stopping or the pausing of the protocol before this communication complexity becomes too small. Uh, and since you pause the protocol at a point where the communication complexity of this rectangle is not is sufficiently large, it means that. Uh, you have some uh, freedom of choosing A and B such that, uh, I mean, since we know that the communication complexity is large, it means that uh, Alice and Bob do not know about any particular row. They do not know any particular eye. 
i where a is greater than bi otherwise the complexity would have been zero and moreover they cannot even restrict uh, the solution to any small set of i's again because otherwise the uh, otherwise uh, the communication complexity of this rectangle would have been small so um so this means that you are free to choose any small set of uh, i's and force it to satisfy a i is less than equal to b i and once okay. you do that, um, uh, so the only thing is that you need to choose the parameters carefully and ensure that the number of the typical rows is not is sufficiently small uh, to allow uh, such that you have enough freedom to force AI smaller or equal to BI on, on all of them. Okay, so you don't have any like huge potential function argument at the very start. It's just no. that when you pause near the end, then you may be doing this averaging argument to hide mm -hmm. the solution in a row which hasn't been communicated about a lot. Uh, actually, there is some potential function because, okay, uh, one of the details I, I, I hid under the rug is that, okay, whenever you force AI is less or equal to BI, I mean, you reveal, some, you give the, the players some information that they didn't know. And you know, some, if you are not careful, that might give them a lot of information. If this was uh -huh. a, a very low probability event, yeah. then uh, that may reveal a lot of information. And, um, <clears throat> and so you somehow have to balance between how much information you reveal on the matrices and how much information you reveal on A's and B, and the A's and B's, and there is some potential function that measures it. Okay. It's not it's not very complicated, but um, but it takes some work, I would say. Um, uh, but uh, this is actually not a new part of this work because similar things have been done in earlier works on the KRW conjecture. Conjecture we just adapt it to this case. The new thing in this work actually is that here it's very easy to force them. I mean, it's very easy to prevent them from working on an atypical row because once we set A is less, than equal, less or equal to BI, they are forbidden from solving the problem on this row. In the non-monotone case, since they are allowed to try to look for a solution in AI where AI equals BI, um, it's not enough to set to force AI equals BI. We also have to, to for uh, to make sure that they cannot find a solution there, uh, sometimes to the extreme of forcing the whole rows to be equal, and that makes things much more complicated. Um, in in this case, in our case, it's actually not that hard. Um, yes, uh, more questions. Uh, okay, so um, uh, so um, okay, so uh, let's so really in this work the the hard part is really showing that solving the K the, the monotone KW relation of G on typical rows takes the uh, this much communication complexity. I mean, I said it earlier as if it was obvious, but and intuitively it should be obvious. But it's not. But it's not really that obvious to prove it. Basically, now Ellis and Bob are given multiple instances of the monotone KW relation of G, and they can choose any of them and solve it. And moreover, they, I said that on the typical row they got less than one bit of information, but they did get one bit of information, and we somehow have to prove that this one bit of information does not make the problem trivial. And it's not all, and it's not always obvious that this can be done. And really, uh, this is where uh, we use the fact that the lower bound is proved by lifting. I mean, I should say that in general, for KW relations or monotone KW relations, I do not know how to prove it. And this is another problem I've been thinking about a lot. 
just this question, if you have multiple, if you have a KW relation of any function or a monotonic KW relation and says you are, and say you are given uh, multiple distinct instances of the problem and you are uh, given also one bit of information about each instance, prove that this is at least as hard as solving a single instance or closely to being as hard. I don't know how to prove it. But in the, in the specific case where there is a reduction from a lifted problem, I do know how to prove it. So, uh, the, so let's start by see how the lifting is relevant. Let's observe that there is a lifted problem that reduces to this. Okay, let's call this problem of given multiple instances, etc., age. And now let's uh, observe that there is a lifted problem that reduces to this problem. So first, let's recall that the original KW relation G had a lifted problem that reduces to it. So now let's look at the following search problem S prime. Given multiple pro instances of the search problem S, choose one of them and solve it. So now if we look at the lifted problem S prime composed with the gadget, it becomes, this lifted problem given, becomes given multiple instances of the original lifted problem, choose one of them and solve it. And, oh, and this problem basically reduces to age, at, at least if we forget about this one bit of information that is known about each instance. Uh, okay, uh, any question about this argument? Maybe I'll need some time to process. Yeah, okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so the thing is that originally we had a reduction from some compose from some search problem composed with a gadget to a single instance of G. And now the point is that if I replace the original search problem S with the with a new search problem that says, given a multiple instances of S, choose one of them and solve it, I get a problem that reduces to the problem of take get take multiple instances of G and solve it, one of multiple instances of G and solve it. Okay, this age was uh, what was left uh, from the uh, earlier slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to kind of the global view was, uh, you know, we followed the adversary strategy for F until you know, some large fraction of coordinates were still left mm -hmm. unsolved, mm -hmm. and. Um, like I think there's like a couple of ways forward. One would be to like if there's a typical row there where you haven't made much progress, you could maybe hope to force that row to, the, to be the only valid um, where a solution is found. Like you could hope to restrict the A and Bs on the, all the other. So I don't have enough power to restrict all the rows, but one. Yeah, so, only okay. force the typical rows. But I cannot. But uh, there may be many typical rows on which they, are, they I can they can choose any of them. Right. So, uh, how are we forcing the A's and B's? Are we making all of the remaining A's and B's such that uh, the the corresponding rows would contain a solution? Like, are we restricting the A's and B's? Uh, are we? The only way we can restrict the A's and B's is to prevent them from solving finding a solution in atypical rows. So maybe I'm not following the question. Uh, question. Um, I mean, we do not have enough. So the, I think the question is maybe like, do do you know that in will every solution to a typical row be a valid solution to the problem then? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, because 
mean, a solution to any row is by definition a, a solution. Uh, sorry, a solution for any row in which AA is greater than BI. Oh, I see what you are saying. You're saying, okay, maybe in some of the typical rows, it also holds that AA is less or equal than BI. Yes, it could be the case. Equal. Yeah, so it could be the case. It could be that there are some typical solution on which, typical rows on which they are also not allowed to solve the problem, but uh, I, okay. Uh, but but I'm actually going to prove a lower bound on the task of finding a solution in any of the typical rows, when whether they are whether they are actually allowed to find a solution there or not. Okay. Uh, was that helpful? Uh, I I guess. Okay. Um, it's just that like the set of AIs and BIs the pairs that are left, they still have the promise from F that at least one of them is like a, you know, has this monotone difference. And uh, and that like this information seems to have lost when you abstract into this multiple copies version, like multiple uh, Yeah, I agree that it loses some information, but... I, yeah, I mean, maybe nothing it, interesting it, is happening there. But actually, I don't need this extra information in order to prove the lower okay. bound. Uh, okay, if... Is there... Okay, but was that slide clear or... I, are there any questions about it? So I'm, I'm happy to just work with this, like many copies of the lifted problem. Okay. And um, so the, again, there is one less issue is that it's not really given multiple instances, choose one of them and solve it, because we also have the additional constraint that a few bits of information are known in advance on each instance. And the solution is really to generalize the lifting theorem to deal with that. And since all lifting theorems of this kind are, proven, are proved using information theoretical arguments that kind of follow how much information is known about each row and maintain an invariant that says that there is not too much information known on each row, it's not too difficult. Uh, the main, the only part that in this generalized lifting theorem that requires some thought is the potential function, because usually in those lifting theorem, we have some potential function that tracks how much information was transmitted uh, about uh, the inputs. And we want to compare this uh, and we want, and basically we want to use it to bound the communication complexity. And the thing is that uh, if usually we measure the information uh, with respect to the set of all, in, of all inputs, I mean, we, we start with the set of all inputs and we measure the information by how much we diverge from that set. We now have to measure information uh, by how much we diverge from the original set of inputs, which was kind of a weird set that all we know about is that it didn't get, there wasn't too much information about each input. So this requires a few more lines in the potential argument, but uh, it's not really a very big obstacle. Uh, okay, so I'm, I am see that I'm again running late now in, in the second hour. I don't mind sitting here some more time and discussing the same monotone composition, but if, but if you would like to finish the talk here, it's also okay. I have time. We, we all live in free countries, I think. So, you know, people just drop out when they don't have time. I think we've gotten this far, you know, we should not give up now. Okay, but, but sort of, I mean, a, a high level question is sort of, I mean, this mysterious thing that we can do this for all gadgets, G such that blah, somehow you're saying, I want all this communication complexity machinery handling like multiple problems and managing information leakage to a limited extent. And somehow the lifting theorems give me techniques for doing this which I sort of plug in with suitable modification. And that's why I can deal with such gadgets. Mm -hmm. That's sort of 
how you were, because it's sort of a little bit of a, when you just read the theorem statements, it's a bit of a mysterious restriction. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, that's what you said is actually a very good summary of it. I mean, uh, we, really all the technical difficulty was already done when the lifting theorems were proved, you could say. Uh, okay, oh, okay, let me put, okay, it's not completely correct. There are, the, the heavy lifting was done in, was done in two parts. First, in, when people proved the lifting theory, the original lifting theorems, they uh, did the part of the, uh, half of the heavy lifting, and the other half of the heavy lifting part comes from the earlier works on the CARW conjecture, in which they developed the, the strategy of Posing the protocol before it just before it solves F and dividing the rows into typical and atypical rows and preventing the players from solving the problem on atypical rows. This whole uh, strategy, I mean, this is a very delicate and complicated argument, but uh, uh, but uh, it was pretty well. But when we came to this work, it was already pretty well developed in previous works on the KRW conjecture. So we didn't have to add much to it, to add much to this machinery. I see, thanks. Uh, sure. So really, okay. I'm, the hard part uh, in, uh, or the really hard part in coming up with this proof is just you no know, taking up all this complicated machinery that exists in earlier work and putting it together and not so much coming up with new machinery uh, but um, actually the semi the part on the semi monotone conjecture as is a bit more novel actually I think even though it's a bit simpler, technically. So uh, in order to get uh, to talk more about the semi-monoton uh, uh, composition, I'd like to first review the universal relation again because it will play a significant part here. Uh, so uh, the universal relation uh, is uh, again Alice gets x, Bob gets y. They are only promised that x is different than y, and they want to find some i on which x i is different than y i. Now, as is usual in communication complexity, working with promised problems is usually kind of inconvenient because we are, the inputs no longer come from rectangles. So it, just to simplify things, we replaced this formulation with an, with an equivalent formulation uh, that's nicer to work with and does give uh, inputs that come from a rectangle. We now no longer give promises on X and Y, and instead we tell the players that if they find out that uh, X equals Y, they can declare failure. They, they can just say, okay, uh, you violated the promise to us, and now we refuse to play with you. And this is just another legal output of the protocol. And um, it is not how to show that this change does not uh, does not increase or decrease significantly the complexity of the problem. So uh, we can do it without loss of generality. And given this modification, it's even easier to see why the communicate why the universal relation is hard because the equality function, which is one of the hardest functions in deterministic communication complexity, uh, reduces to the universal relation. Basically, if you want to solve equality on X and Y, you just feed X and Y uh, to the universal relation and see whether the players find some coordinate on which they differ or they declare failure. So sort of a, a super hand wavy way of saying why it's okay to violate the promise is that really any efficient protocol won't be able to tell that we're violating the promise anyway. I mean, in order for you to detect this, you've already communicated a loss anyway, and then we won. Uh, okay, so I can prove it in, again, two, uh, two sentences. Let's say we have a protocol for the original universal relation, and now let's run it uh, on X and Y without the promise. 
so when the protocol ends, it will output some coordinate i uh, on which x and i is supposed to be different than y i. Now, obviously, if we violated the promise, it's not going to be the case because x and y are equal. So at this point, Alice and Bob can just uh, send x i and y i to each other and check if x i is really different than y i. And if they figure out that this is not the case, they declared failure. Mm -hmm. yes. So we're just sending two more bits. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, let me also remind the definition of semi monotone composition. Um, so uh, the players are promised that uh, A is different than B and the uh, and in roles where AI is different than BI, they can they are allowed to solve uh, monotone, the monotone KW relation of G. And in other uh, roles, they can solve the universal relation, but they are, it's still the original, the universal relation, the original universal relation. That is, they are not promised that there even is a solution there. Um, and if that is, if the rows are equal, they are not allowed to say, oh, we found those two equal rows that we declare failure. Uh, they just cannot solve, they just cannot solve the problem on these rows. Um, but to, as but what they can do is what we are going to do is again going to the to a nicer variant as in the original universal relation. And instead of promising that A is different than B we tell the players that if they detect that A is equal to B, they are, then they are allowed to, de to declare failure. And in the actual lower bound, in the actual lower bounds, we usually just make sure that this will never happen, but it's easier to work with this variant because now we have rectangles instead. Now the players work with, now the inputs are in nice rectangles other in, rather than in some weird sets. Um, and, the and again, the reason that the nicer version is uh, equivalent is, uh, is just by a similar argument. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, any questions so far? Okay. So now, uh, let, uh, so now uh, the, our result says that if G is a monotone function and, uh, and we have a lifted search problem that reduces to the monotone KW relation of G and this lifting theorem uh, yields that the, a lower one of at least T and we had the additional con constraint that the gadget is actually the equality function, which is and this is really important as we'll see soon. And the main reason we use this particular lifting theorem is that this is more or less the only lifting theorem that allows this choice of gadget. There is another lifting theorem uh, due to Shagnik Mutopatiai. And I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the other co-author. Is it Bruno Loff? Yes, right, Bruno Loff, sure, yeah. Uh, but they, did, but they uh, did not lift query complexity. They, they lifted uh, some other complexity measure that is not useful for our purposes. Uh, I mean, it is a good complexity measure, but not just not useful in our particular setting. So this is the only lifting theorem that both allows the gadget to be equality and lifts a, a complexity measure that we can use. And um, uh, and for uh, this, uh, and under those assumptions, we show that the communication complexity of the same monotone composition is the sum, is the communication complexity of the universal relation plus the, lo plus the lower bound we get on the lifted problem. Mm 
uh, questions? Okay, so I'll go, so this is the intuition slide I explained before, but I'll go over it again to remind people, to remind people. So the thing, so in the monotone result, the, one of the key ideas was that we could force the players to solve, to solve the problem on a row where AI is greater than BI, or in other, which meant that we could force the players to solve the, to solve the monotone KW relation of G on one of the rows. Uh, rather than solving the universal relation. So this reduced to the problem to showing that uh, solving one instance of the monotone clean W relation of G out of many is hard. And we could solve the latter problem using the leasing theorem. And in the semi-monotone result, we can no longer use this KRW trick that uh, forces the, the players to find a solution where AI is greater than BI. Uh, and the solution can act, could actually always be found either in rows where AI is different than BI or in rows where AI equals BI. Actually, this is, this is what makes this notion of semi-monotone composition so interesting, in my opinion, because it, present, it prevents exactly the trick that makes the monotone setting easy. And uh, the play, and in, and now the issue is that the players can solve either uh, the, an instance of the of MKWG on some row, or they can could try to solve the, the universal relation on some rows. And in doing the, this, they take the chance that there is, there is no solution in that row, but they are still allowed to do it. And this means that now, if you want to delegate all the hard work to the listing theorem, uh, we, it's not enough to, uh, to, for the lifting theorem to be able to analyze the monotone KW relation of G. We need the lifting theorem also to be able to handle the universal relation. And this is where the, so in other words, it's not enough that there is some lifted problem that reduces to the monotone KW relation of G. Uh, we also need that some lifting, lifted problem would reduce to the universal relation. And, we can do it exactly because uh, we could use we can use the equality gadget, and the equality gadget uh, because the structure of the universal relation that uh, checks whether uh, some uh, checks that asks the player to look for a coordinate in which they differ. Uh, we can handle it using the equality gadget. Now, but I should say that this is kind of an intuition. Uh, the actual argument is more complicated, as you will see. And if we want to, but before I get into the technical details, any questions so far? Okay, so the way we, uh, the lower band actually works is using a proof technique a lower bound technique called the Rasborov rank method. And this uh, technique says that uh, if, we are give, if you are given a communication problem and you want to prove a lower bound on it, then you try to come up with some matrix A that has the following properties. First, the rows of A and are indexed by inputs of Alice and the columns of A are indexed by inputs of Bob. And we want the rank of A to be large and also uh, for every monochromatic rectangle of the problem, we want the rank of the corresponding submetrics to be small. So a monochromatic rectangle of the communication problem is just a combinatorial rectangle, such that all the inputs in, the rectang in this combinatorial rectangle have a common solution that is legal for all of them. And we want that for if we take any such combinatorial rectangle and restrict the matrix to this combinatorial rectangle, we get a low rank matrix. This method is, can be sort of as a generalization of the standard rank method in communication complexity that works also for search problems and uh, non-Boolean functions, whereas the original rank method is, works mostly for um, uh, either Boolean problems or Oh, okay, sorry, it works for uh, the original ARC method can deal with non-Boolean functions, but it cannot deal with search problems. 
and this may, and the Rasborov run method can deal with such problems. So for a ver for a, as a, an example for this method, let's look at the identity matrix, uh, and we and we can see that this that the identity matrix can actually serve as this kind of a Rasborov matrix for the universe, for the universal relation because the universal relation have two has two kinds of uh, rectangles. Uh, it has those rectangles that say that uh, x is different than y on some coordinate. Now, uh, if we look at such a rectangle, then in this rectangle, all the uh, all the in, all the pairs of strings in this rectangle are going to be different strings. So the identity so this whole so if we restrict the identity matrix to such a rectangle, we will get the, the all zeros uh, matrix whose rank is obviously zero. And, on the, and the other kind of monochromatic rectangles are rectangles that correspond to declaring failure. And these are rectangles in which all the pairs of strings have to be equal strings. So those strings must consist only of a single entry and therefore they must be of rank one. So all the monochromatic rectangles are, have small rank and the rank of the identity matrix at large is of course a full run, is very large run. The nice thing about the Lithin theorem of, that we use is that um, it yields such a Rasborov matrix for uh, the monotone KW relation of G. And specifically, we are going to use it uh, to use such a Rasborov matrix over F2, which is uh, useful for our calculations. And now we are going to use those two observations, this matrix for the monochrome KW relation of G and the, and the fact that the identity matrix is a Rasborov matrix for the universal relation to construct a, a Rasborov matrix for the semi monochrome com composition. How are we going to do that? Um, so again, we have this Rasborov matrix A for G, we have the, Rasbo the identity matrix I for U, and we want to construct, construct a new Rasborov matrix, which will denote by M for the composed problem, for the composed relation. So let me describe, so I'll first describe how this matrix M is going to be constructed. It's going to be a fairly intuitive construction. First, let's note that by definition, the rows and columns of M are going to be indexed by inputs of Ellis and Bob, which are in our case, matrices X and Y. And recall that again, that there are those strings A and B that we obtain by applying G to the rows and to the rows of X and Y. And now we're going to partition the, the matrix M into blocks. We are going to view it as a block matrix and we're going to have a block for each choice of A and B. That is within the same block, all the matrix, all the matrices have the same string, all the matrices X, all the rows have the, are going to have the same string A and all the columns are going to have the same string B we are going to have a block for each choice of A and B. And uh, we're going to denote by M, A, B, the block of M that uh, corresponds to the pair A, B. Um, questions so far? Intuitively, um, each such block corresponds to the, to the residual problem when Alice and Bob have already figured out A and B and uh, are trying to solve the problem on, on the, on this particular, on, in this particular setting where we've already fixed A and B. So uh, I would yeah. attempt some kind of a tensor product of the yeah. matrix. Exactly. So uh, the next step is really to use the tensor product or the conical product. Um, and we, and for fixed A and B, we are going to put for each coordinate, we are going to take the tensor product of uh, M matrices, where M is just the length of A and B, it's just a number of rows. And at each coordinate of the tensor product, we are going to put either A or I, depending on whether the players are playing uh, the, K, the monotone KW relation of G or, uh, the, or the universal relation on this solve. 
there is one exception uh, on blocks where A equals B, we're going to set, uh, 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 we're going to set the block to be the zero, the all zeros matrix, uh, rather than uh, the, this tensor product, because uh, if we took, if we went by the, uh, the original formula, if we went by this tensor product, we would get the identity matrix, which has a very large rank, but in the case where A equals B, they are going to fail. So we want this block to have a very small rank. So we are going to set it to be the all zeros. Basically, if A equals B, they are, they are going to fail. They are not going to play at all. So there is no point of putting a tensor product of A's and I's there. They are just going to fail. Um, uh, questions about this construction? Okay, so now we need to prove two things. First, that M has a large rank, and second is that uh, for every monochromatic rectangle R, the, rest, the restricted matrix has a small rank. So the, for the first part, all I can say is that we prove it by Gaussian elimination. Actually, I don't have any intuition why it works. Just you do Gaussian elimination and you get that it has full rank. Uh, one important part about it is that we use a property of A that says that A times A equals I. And this is something that we get by going into the lifting theorem and looking how exactly it constructs this pattern mat uh, matrix A. And noting that and showing that it really satisfies this property, and in order to get this property, we there, it's really crucial that the gadget equals the equality gadget. And what's really going on here is that the identity matrix is the matrix is the matrix of the equality function, and that a times a is therefore the matrix of the equality function. I think I am I'm quite sure I haven't completely verified it, but I'm quite sure that. In general, if you take any an arbitrary gadget, you, you would get that A times A equals the matrix of the gadget. But, uh, uh, but the identity matrix is the only gadget that works for us here. Okay, so um, a bit more interesting part is showing that every that the matrix restricted to any monochromatic rectangle R has small rank. So first of all, again, if we look at a rectangle that corresponds to failure, which, which means that the players have found out that A equals B, then we get the all zeros matrix and then it clearly has rank zero. And on the other hand, and, uh, and otherwise, this the monochromatic rectangle means that the players found some solu a solution in some row i, and just for simplicity of notation, let's say that uh, the, they found a the solution in the first row. Now, since R corresponds to finding a solution in the row in the row i, and this and finding a solution in the row in the O I O in the first row means they either solve the monotone KW relation G on this row or they solve the universal relation of this row. There is some corresponding monochromatic rectangle of the monotone KW relation of G or the universal relation that corresponds to the solution they found on this row. So let's denote this small this monochromatic rectangle of this single row by R star. Now it's relatively simple to show that if that this restricted matrix M uh, restricted by R, if you look at each block, we get that it looks just like the original matrix, except that the first coordinate of the tensor product is restricted to R star. 
And since we chose the, the, this, this first C to be either the Rasborov matrix of, of, the mono, of the monotone KW relation of G or the identity matrix, which is the Rasborov matrix of the universal relation, we know that the rank of this, of this matrix C to R star is small. And therefore the rank of the whole matrix is going to be small. I mean, we, are, we just gained the decrease in the rank from restricting this smaller matrix to R star. Um, and uh, okay, this is, I think, all I had to say about the technical part. So small in the sense is like, I mean, the other guys could a priori have like huge rank, but we're happy that we shaved off like a one over M fraction. Exactly, because that's exactly, yeah, exactly. And the reason is that intuitively the lower bound we are trying to prove is corresponds to solving one instance of the KW relation of G or the universal relation. We are not trying to prove that a lower bound that corresponds to solving M instances. We are trying to prove a lower bound that corresponds only to solving a single instance. So, I mean, we are trying to prove a lower bound that corresponds to the amount of work required to solve a single instance. So we only need the rank deficiency that comes from a single coordinate. Makes sense, thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, we proved the monotone KW. So in this work, we proved the monotone KW conjecture for every F and every G that comes from, whose lower bound comes from lifting query complexity. And that's basically every G where we have a lower bound except for matching. And uh, we define this new notion of semi-monotone composition, which personally I really like. That's like my favorite comp contribution of this work, this, just this definition. Um, and uh, we have this, um, and we prove the semi-monotone um, KRW conjecture again for, for the universal relation and every G whose lower bound is proved by the lifting theorem. Uh, of uh, yeah, of the Rizente, uh, Jacob, uh, Suzanne de Rizente, Jacob Nordstrom, Tony Pitassi, uh, Robert Robert, and Mark Vignals. And uh, this is again a large family that includes ST connectivity, click, and generation. Now, for some open problems, so as I said earlier, the monotone conjecture itself might be tractable. It doesn't, there isn't any obvious barrier to solving it. It doesn't prove any circuit lower bounds that we don't know. And proving it might be an interesting step toward solving the KRW conjecture. And it is also interesting in its own right. But for start, can, can we prove the, KR, the monotone KRW conjecture for a single G that, we don't yet know how to cover, which is the matching function. And I don't know how to prove the KRW conjecture for the, the monotone KRW conjecture for G equals matching. And I think it's a nice problem. It won't have any groundbreaking implications, but it's a nice open problem. And it might so, take us one step way, closer to the full conjecture. Yes. So um, to, to prove it for matching, you you would only need this direct some kind of a result, right? So when you have yes, many the, copies. Yeah, yeah, actually, yes, the, the real, I mean, I'll only need this kind of uh, lower bound that says that if you want to uh, solve mul one of multiple instances of matching, where we know a few bits of information about each instance, mm -hmm. then it's as, almost as hard as solving a single instance of matching without yeah, really any nice, information. Really nice formulation. Yeah. And um, yeah, that seems like very attackable. Like, well, certainly, you'd think that uh, you can co prove it for one copy. <laughs> yeah. So definitely. Yeah, I, I think it should be doable. I mean, uh, because also the lower one for matching is also also uses some kind of information theoretical argument. 
not exactly the same, or, or, or to be more specific, the argument reduces to disjointness, but the lower bound to disjointness is based on, info, on an information theoretical argument. Uh, so uh, then I, so I assume that, I suppose that one could probably solve it by first proving such a result for disjointness, like some, proving something like, even if you saw, if you, if you get, if you are trying to solve one instance of disjointness out of multiple, assuming you know a few bits of information about each instance of disjointness. And this should probably be not too hard because of the techniques that are used to establish the lower bound on disjointness. And then maybe the reduction to matching would work as before. But this is just yeah, so, don't know. so the this direct something for set disjointness sounds maybe it's already known. I guess I'm worried more about the fact that the lower bound is proved by a randomized reduction to set disjointness or from mm -hmm. set disjointness. And yeah. so I don't know how like you have to somehow avoid randomness in all these KRW arguments. Uh, no, not really, because I mean, it's true that it's, uh, I mean, already, for, I mean, it's true that you have to avoid randomized arguments, but Oh, oh, okay. Let me say it. Let, let, it, let me mention it. It's important that this uh, this thing that you cannot allow randomized pro, randomized protocols only holds for the non-monotone setting. In the monotone setting, we actually know a few uh, K, KW relations that have a large monotone complexity. One of them is matching. I mean, the original proof of the lower bound of matching also proves the lower bound on the randomized complexity of the sure. KW relation of matching. So I wouldn't worry about that. The, the only deterministic protocols limitation is only for, K, for deterministic, for non-monotone KW relations. But, um, so I see, Personally, I'm more interested in the semi-monotone KRW conjecture because I think that would probably bring us closer to the non-monotone KRW conjecture. And, for, and I think the most important problem here is just to replace the universal relation with a function. With a function. And, and ideally still put some nice family of Gs there, or even just any non-trivial choice of F and G, say, can we prove it for F equals parity and G equals ST connectivity or click or your favorite monotone problem. I mean, all of, uh, basically anything that does not know, follow for, that is not already known for the non-monotone case would be interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, the thing is that such proof would have to go, you would have to work using different techniques because this Rasborov uh, rank method doesn't work for uh, KW for non-monotone KW relations. Um, I mean, it, it, the, it's another one of those barriers to non to non-monotone uh, KW relations. Uh, they have very small Rasborov uh, like complexity. So, um, so. Actually, I would be very interested. So I think that actually uh, maybe a first step, and no, no, I don't know if it's a first step, but one, one thing that could be helpful is trying to prove a, a lifting theorem that works for equality and uh, that works with the equality gadget uh, using an adversary argument along the lines that is used for the Ras McKenzie type lifting theorems. We actually know that it is that we can to do a fully general that such I mean you cannot lift you cannot prove a lifting a fully general lifting theorem for query complexity using uh, uh, using the equality gadget but maybe you can use you can find some lifting theorem that uses a more restricted complexity measure that on the one hand would allow the equality gadget on the, and on the other hand would uh, uh, allow, would give us some interesting, would be useful for our setting and would be able to handle uh, um, K monotone KW relations. Okay, this is it. Uh, thank you for, uh, so, sorry for going so much out of time and thank you very much for listening for such a long time.
Absolutely. Again, no worries. Our pleasure. So just one question regarding your, your list of open questions. Would you like to comment anything on how all of this is related to this recent work that you advertised on the general KRW conjectures for many F and Gs by yourself and was it Filmus and others? Oh, oh. Is, oh. oh. yeah. Yes. Um, okay, you... Uh, just a moment, I'll go back to its statement. I don't think so you are asking about how the open problems relate to it or how someone's, something else is related to it. I, it was a sort of a very open-ended question. I was like, how the, the, that result compared to what you presented today, is it like orthogonal or that is like stronger uh, or I, weaker? I, I, would or... So, I would say it's orthogonal. First, of, I mean, uh, this this result, I mean, uh, it's very nice, but uh, it's also very limited in the type of functions it can handle. First of all, it is known that this tight adversary bound can never give formula complexity. This adversary bound can never give a formula lower bound that is uh, larger than n squared, or in other words, it can never give depth complexity that is larger than, than two log n. So this result, by definition, can never prove the uh, the KRW conjecture for any G whose depth complexity is more than two log n, uh, which kinds of restricts us to very simple functions. So parity is a, such a very simple function. Uh, subjectivity is such a very simple function. We can we can also get a, a nice, but no, a, a, some nice result for majority, even though it's not really tight. But those are, but it's not like, but it's all, but it, but this result really can can really deal mostly with those relatively simple G's. It cannot deal with like very complicated or in functions such as uh, ST connectivity or clique or generation or things like that that are kind of more interesting. Um, in a in a sense. I, oh, maybe I should also say that, um, okay, I need to think about it for a moment, but uh, if I am, but I believe, no, no, yeah, I, actually, in fact, this adversary bound should already, should also prove a lower, the adversary bound itself actually also prove a, proves a lower bound on the randomized communication complexity of the KW relation of G. So, so you so the so uh, this kind of technique only works for uh, G's whose KW relation has the uh, has good randomized communication complexity, and as I said, though, I mean this stops at two log n. See? It's like only very simple functions. I see. Thanks. Uh, sure. Maybe I'll ask one more just about mm -hmm. the. Um semi-monotone result mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. so it was very linear algebraic but what would happen if you tried to repeat this adversary style combinatorial argument um, so it worked in the monotone case but in the semi-monotone I, I suppose something goes wrong yes so the thing that goes wrong is uh, is exactly that step that says that you cannot force Edison Bob to solve uh, the game on the row where a is greater than bi. And this means that now when you want, okay, somewhere in the lower bar, okay, so let's go again over this adversary argument. And let's recall this this, this step where we want to for, to prevent Alice and Bob from solving the problem on an, on an atypical row. So in the monotone case, it was relatively easy. We just had to force the constraint that a is small, is this or equal, then bi and we were done once we could for, do this forcing uh, we we were sure that Alice and bob are no longer going to solve this uh, solve the problem on an atypical row on the 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 equivalent of this in the um in the semi monotone case and also in non monotone case it's the same difficulty in both settings is that uh, now we somehow want to prevent Alice and Bob from solving the problem on an atypical row. 
And now the question is, how do you prevent them from doing that? I mean, you can no longer say, okay, now I set AI equals to BA and you're not allowed anymore to look for a solution here. No, because they are allowed to, to look for a solution anywhere they want. So the way it works in earlier works on the KRW conjecture is that um, they maintain throughout the adversary argument, also in the second stage, that at any given point, they can, the adversary can make sure that any atypical row is equal. On any atypical row, the matrices are equal. I mean, I mean, basically throughout the second half of the argument, when we, the second half is when they're trying to solve the monotone KW relation of G, the adversary has to maintain the invariant that whenever the players are trying to say, oh, we actually try to solve it on this typical row, the adversary tells them, no, 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 you can't do it. I just set these whole rows to be equal. There is no solution there, no matter how hard you look for there. You look, it, you look for it, so no, you can't do it. But now, trying to maintain this, in, this invariant where a whole row can be equal uh, is much harder because, I mean, if you, one thing you could do is try to actually just set the inputs, uh, all the typical rows to be equal uh, from start. But uh, I mean, just to choose the input such that all the typical rows are are equal to each other. But if you are doing that, you are revealing tons of information to the players. I mean, setting two rows to be equal to each other reveals a lot of information to the players. And, now, and this information now can turn rows that were typical into new atypical rows. I mean, because previously they only had one bit of information on each typical row, but now you are revealing a lot more information so now, so now they may have a lot of information about the typical rows, etc. So, so you can't really decide. Okay, I'm just setting all the typical, all the atypical rows to be equal. Or sorry, actually, you can do that. We did it in the work with with Siri Dinuron Parity, but in general, it's something that is very hard to do. Mm -hmm. So, so the the other possibility is what was done in other works such as Edmonds et al in which they just maintain the possibility to make the typical rows equal without forcing them to be equal. But that's much harder to do. Uh, okay, I hope that was a useful answer. Yeah. Um, I really like this direct sub question. Yeah, it, yeah, I too. Actually, I want to ask you this you mentioned this paper of yours and others about this choice problem. Uh, where did it appear? Uh... Well, so it's like I had a paper at iCalp uh, last year, the power mm -hmm. of many samples in query complexity, but that's kind of subsumed by this paper of um, Charlotte and David and Eric Blay. It's, it was the best paper at uh, Fox Stock last year which is like new minimax theorems for randomized computation. And they had a oh. sibling paper proving composition results. Oh, that's that's really interesting. I should look it up. I mean, yes, this choice problem in the exam uh, is really interesting in general, and it's very important for the KRW conjecture in particular. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I should have mentioned it, when, but I was already, uh, while talking about this, this part, but I was already out of time, so I didn't want to get in, mm -hmm. into it. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, more questions? Uh, okay, so. Uh, so thank uh, you yeah. so much, Or. This uh, was so fantastic. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Jakob, could you turn off the recording? Yes, I just want to thank you once again for this fantastic seminar uh, before I do so uh, and uh, and for answering all the questions and uh, and uh, so but I think it's fair now that we can say we can call it a day we did a day of honest work so thank you so mm -hmm. much.